Um, I'm Margaret Willard Traub. Welcome to our faculty roundtable on our first community read, The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks. I do want to make sure that I mention that we do have, um, by virtue of the hub and the generosity of the library, we have copies of the book available for, um, <coughs> for faculty who, who are thinking about teaching with, with the text. Um, but don't own a copy yet, they want, might want to uh, take a look at it uh, this summer. So if you can uh, spread the word to colleagues, and um, that Holly has, she's taken stock of that, of that um, stockpile of books, yeah. But thanks for coming today, I know it's a really busy time of the semester. Um, and thanks especially to our faculty um, <coughs> respondents, panelists today, Terry Laws, Francine Banner, and Maureen, Maureen Linker, all of whom have taught with the book previously and are going to share uh, first the, a little bit of background on the courses that they, they were teaching that it integrated the book and how they integrated that into their curriculum and then um, their particular take on the significance of the book for that, for that class material. So without further ado, would you like to start? To sure. Okay. sure. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Terry Laws, and I'm glad to be here. Um, first thing, actually, I'd like to say about the book is that it's a fabulous read. If you haven't read it before, uh, reads very much like a novel, and that's coming from a person who really does not like to read fiction. Uh, but it is so. Um, it is such a quick read. Um, um, just to tell on myself, I actually read it for my fun reading. Um, after uh, after my um, written exam, after my written qualifying exams, before my before my oral defense, so it's <laughs> fun. <laughs> so, uh, so I have used the book in a, at a couple different universities in um, in the healthcare ethics me medical ethics course. Um, I've used it for a couple of um, uh, in a couple <laughs> different ways. There are, uh, um, there's an assignment that I use that I trade off. Um, I do either healthcare ethics in the news or I do a book critique in which it, it offers the opportunity for the students to give, an, to give their application of the, of the course material that they've learned all year. I teach the course in a very um, uh, social, from a very social and cultural lens. So they are using, um, from a very practical sense in the course, the, um, uh, the language of healthcare ethics and medical ethics as they would use them in a clinical setting. Um, and in doing so, then um, the book gives them an opportunity to talk about both um, the healthcare treatment issues that are in the, in the text, but also research ethics, because I do spend a good deal of time on uh, uh, research ethics or clinical research ethics in the course. So the assignment, the major assignment then that I typically use it for is the book critique. And uh, again, they will have learned the concepts and uh, the concepts and the procedures of bioethical reasoning throughout the term. And then they are using the text to, um, to locate ethical issues that they then identify and are able to write about. Um, so I also came to this book through pleasure reading and the minute I read it I said I want to teach this book and so was really waiting for the opportunity <laughs> to do so. Um, and uh, that opportunity came up in the context of the Inside Out Prison Exchange class. So my experience with the book is a little bit different probably than most faculty members would be. Um, Inside Out, if you're not familiar, is a program that brings 15 Dearborn students into a maximum security prison to take classes with 15 inside students. And the facility we're currently teaching at, um, Macomb Correctional, is an all-male facility. And so largely, um, the majority of students taking the Inside Out course will be women, um, and they're going into a class with um, all men. Uh, and my larger objective always in that class is to ultimately get the students both inside and outside to reflect on the importance and significance of their environment. And so to think about what it means to be taking a class in a prison and to start to critically critique issues around incarceration. Um, but uh, I've always thought uh, you don't want to barge in heavy handed with that kind of topic. Um, and so as I read the Lax book I thought this touches on so many of the larger issues surrounding us um, uh, relating to the person and the state 
that I would like them to focus on in a relatively neutral territory. That is to say, this is a political book, but it's not a book that immediately is going to say, let's talk about this. Um, the Inside Out class, um, the, the topic I picked um, was the person in the state. I really wanted to call it the body and the state, but the warden isn't particularly friendly at the facility, and I thought that would be a red flag, um, so I called it person. Um, and uh, we, I, I paired this with the new Jim Crow as the other major book we read at the end of the class, which, if you've read it, also has some similar themes. Um, I'm a lawyer by training, so we talked a lot about the 14th Amendment, and we also talked about sterilization and abortion and reproductive rights as well. Um, uh, the Inside Out class is challenging for a couple of reasons uh, that are besides being in the prison. Um, one is that it's cross-listed a thousand times, and so uh, you are teaching multiple disciplines. I think uh, there's psychology, criminal justice, sociology, and history right now. Um, and then students across campus always take it. So I had a couple of bio majors. Um, I've had engineering majors in the class. Um, and then for the inside students, um, they need to have a GED to take the class. So it's a broad variety of uh, people that come from the inside. There are people that don't have a formal high school education. There are some <coughs> self-taught people that may have been in prison since 16. And then I have a couple of students each semester that have master's degrees. Um, so it's a really, really wide range. Um, and so I picked this book because it was accessible, I thought, in terms of level of student. Um, it's a readable and a good story, uh, and then also because it addressed so many issues across these different majors. Mm -hmm. And so uh, from women's and gender studies, I talked about intersectionality, uh, looking at uh, different characters in the book. We looked at uh, issues similar to what Terry and I think Maureen may have looked at around ethics. Um, we looked at uh, what it means to be a qualitative researcher from a sociological perspective. So um, we can talk today about stories about Rebecca herself and the challenges she has in research. Um, and then also looking at uh, the idea of larger criminal justice theory. So um, Maureen and I talked about utilitarianism and how these different theories kind of are interlaced in the book. Um, and the students really liked it. So I, I'd say it was, it was a success. <coughs> Thanks. Um, hi, so I'm Maureen Linker. I'm a professor of philosophy and also the interim director of the library. Um, and so shout out to the library folks for helping to set this up and a great partnership um, <coughs> with, um, with student success. And thank you, Margaret, for your organization and Holly. Um, so I've taught uh, the book in philosophy of science. And I, so I didn't, I didn't come to it as a a, a fun read, although I absolutely agree with what both Terry and Francine said about the readability of the book. And that's what the feedback I've gotten from students, is that they found it really engaging and really readable, and actually that the, the science was accessible um, to them in, in good ways. So I teach a philosophy of science course that has um, generally half of the students are philosophy majors who are planning on doing graduate work in philosophy. And the other half are science majors who are doing it because of their interest in science. And so that can cross through social sciences and natural sciences. Um, <clears throat> so the way I've structured the course is the first half of the course is kind of a history of science um, with a focus on enlightenment methodology, but sort of roots in Aristotle. But then um, moving up through the 1600s and 1700s um, with Newtonian mechanics, but more importantly, the kind of um, the view that emerges of science through the Enlightenment as um, based in reason and evidence and um, value free, free of bias, um, that science is oriented toward objectivity and that science is progressive, that science is always moving forward. Um, and so the first half of the semester, we look in detail at uh, the, the notion of the man of reason and Enlightenment ideals and the um, increase in scientific methodology from sort of craft to academic um, legitimacy, the, the formation of laboratories, and kind of purposefully we note things in the first half, and then the second half of the course is then looking at all of the ways in which this is quite a problematic conception, and, um, and, and so I've always looked for intersectional cases for the second half of the semester, cases that were the intersection of um, gender, race, ethnicity, social class come together to, to show why this narrative has been 
both um, problematic um, and, <coughs> and in some ways inconsistent. Um, and that values do work their way into science in important ways and that the pretense to value neutrality has meant that we haven't actually done a good job at looking in the way in which science has been, <coughs> um, has promoted certain kinds of values and, um, and, and not been accountable to those. And so when the book came out, it sounded, when I first heard the review of it, it sounded like it would fit. So I had done readings on um, John Money's work in Canada on, um, on the um, sexual surgery for, um, uh, for infants um, who, had, um, who, are, who had ambiguous genitalia. And so that was, those cases were good for students to read. We've looked at stuff at Tuskegee, um, readings on that. But, um, so this book seemed to fit a variety of intersecting issues. Um, and then when I read it before I taught it, I thought, oh, this will be something that students can get through pretty quickly. Um, and so I've taught it now twice, and it's been very popular when I give students the option at the end of the, uh, for paper choices. Um, I've had at least half or more than half of the students will choose to write about this book. So I think that's a real testament to the interest because we've read quite a few things. Um, so what I've focused on in, uh, in, with, with my students um, as we go through the book um, are really, I'll talk about two things. One is the question of um, utilitarian models of decision making in, um, in science and in medicine in particular. So the idea of utilitarian ethics is that we promote the greatest good for the greatest number of people. Um, uh, the question of what constitutes the greatest good can be argued and reasoned about what the idea of the, uh, the, there's no greatest number and there doesn't seem to be a greatest good, but nevertheless, that's been a model that has been operative, that we, um, that our obligation ethically when we have limited resources is to um, maximize well-being. Um, and that may mean at the cost of the few for the benefit of the common good. And so <laughs> in one way, the story could be treated as a simple case of utilitarian calculus, right? Um, so it's one individual and her cells versus curing polio and, you know, creating opportunities for in vitro fertilization and um, developing cures for cancer and, you know, 1,700 patents and all of this terrific results in terms of healing. It looks like it, for, on a utilitarian calculus, it's not, uh, it's not a complicated issue. Um, but of course, after students start reading and learning more about Henrietta Lacks' life and the life of her family, and then the subsequent publication of their whole <coughs> genome, um, three years after the book came out, um, it complicates the issue um, for the better in, in a way that students, starts to recognize, students start to recognize that this idea of promoting the greatest good um, on ethical grounds doesn't take into account profitability, racism, institutionalized discrimination, sexism, uh, authoritarianism of science, um, and scientific experts. Um, and so that has generated really rich and interesting discussions. And then the second theme that has been really fruitful for, for the class is looking at the competing goals between um, researchers, right? So as researchers um, creating knowledge and generating knowledge and producing knowledge to share is a goal. Um, but for um, clinical physicians and for clinical care workers, it's addressing the, um, the needs of the individual, right, and the, or the individual in the context of their family. Um, and so the, the narrative of the book, I think Scoot does a really good job in the book um, with, with Lax's daughter as uh, a, the, really the, the voice of this effort, that, um, that those goals are, are both the idea of research producing a lot of knowledge and clinical care workers interested in the well-being of an individual and their family are competing goals and, um, and in between those two is a non-scientific goal and that's profitability, right, and marketability. Um, and, <clears throat> and so how do you navigate through those? Because it might, the researchers, certainly folks at Johns Hopkins thought that they were doing um, the, the right thing by sharing um, the cells, and the, the, the question of cl 
critical care ethics in the individual um, do doesn't get addressed until the family finally is able to advocate um, uh, on behalf of their mother. Um, but missing from that those both those uh, both of those goals is how it is that there we can disseminate profitability um, without being committed to either of those two communities. So that, those that's, those are an overview of some of the themes that have emerged with my students. So at this point, I didn't come prepared with a, a list of questions. I mean, some threads are certainly appearing, but I wanted to open it up to um, to all of us to to. Um, Follow whatever's of interest. So, yeah. Can you describe the paper, like uh, the, you know, what are the, what do you have them do in the paper? What are the yeah, so there's a couple of topics that they can choose, or they can devise their own topic um, with an okay, just to make sure that the scope of the the papers is um, reasonable for the project. So um, one is looking at this question of um, the utilitarian calculus within the context of si of medical decision making. Um, another is um, to look at the question of um, the, the obligations of um, science to the communities in which uh, they work in, uh, from where, where people draw their research. Um, and, um, and students have, particularly students who are familiar with IRB approval, like right, having to get approval. So, I don't know if you have found this, either of you have found this, but my students are shocked when they find out that if they like get a mole removed, that that tissue could be used without their consent and that there's nothing illegal about that. Um, and in fact, it, there's nothing illegal even if, um, even if it's clearly used for profit, right? There was a lawsuit that, um, following the book that, um, so they're shocked about that. Um, they do, so, they, so with the development of informed consent, right, the idea with informed consent is that um, you need to get approval and the uh, person whose tissue is being used um, will, um, their identity will be kept private and that they're, um, and that you can't research, research off of an individual who's identifiable. But if you come in for another medical procedure and it's not under the guise of a decided research program. So, that, so informed consent is a topic that students often get interested in writing about with this, um, the, the justice of informed consent. And in particular, we look at the way in which the notion of the body is treat, has been treated as property um, in, in US law and also you know, the, the philosophical roots behind that in John Locke, the idea that you know, your, your body should be protected in the way your property should be protected. And yet, when your cells are removed for a medical procedure, it's no longer considered property um, in that way. And so that will be often the focus, um, the question of property and informed consent. Is it like five pages, 10 pages? Is it About 10 pages, 10 usually. Pages. Do you want to speak to any assignments you do um, something similar? So actually, I would add just a couple other things I thought about that um, since we're talking about the entire community, um, so I sort of thought about it in terms, so my undergraduate degree is in business, so I know very different from what I'm doing now, uh, but because it is, then I sort of try to think about some ways that in each of our colleges that we might uh, attempt to um, think about application. Um, so we've talked about some of the themes but, in, but there are also episodes in the book that lend themselves to um, either cross-disciplinary conversation, which we're clearly having in our courses, but also um, cross-disciplinary opportunities for students to talk to each other. So for example, I think about the episode of there's, um, so once um, it is understood that the cells are uh, immortal, um, there's a need to um, produce, to mass produce these cells. And the cells get mass produced at first at Tuskegee, what is now Tuskegee University. So we are accustomed to thinking about Tuskegee in terms of the injustice of the, the syphilis experiments. What we don't think, or what the book gives, the, that episode from the book gives those, us though, gives business students an opportunity to think about 
what if we were thinking about Tuskegee in terms of its, its ability or its capacity to produce ma or mass produce these cells, which based on the business networks that are um, known by some of the researchers um, and some of the uh, clinicians actually, because they know each other, the cells actually get moved from Tuskegee and this mass production where they have hired dozens of people to become, to be scientists who, who mass produce. What if that model, you know, using not just history, so there's another um, sort of arts and sciences link, not just using history, but also using the possibility that what if HBCUs had access to creating this kind of business models? So today, the company that eventually got that contract, they still exist, right? And the wealth that have been produced off her cells very clearly could be wealth that could be in black communities today, right? But instead of having that conversation about black communities, we're, we're having a conversation about lots of other conversations, but generally our conversations about black communities end up being conversations about deficits. And yet we don't see how these deficits are produced. So, so for business students who think they have absolutely nothing, right, <laughs> to do with Henrietta Lacks and herself, there actually are ways that we can use, use certain episodes to begin to have conversations across the campus, which is the goal to begin with, right? Mm -hmm. So we, we understand very clearly how we can talk about justice, how we can talk about um, the, the ethical parts, but we also can talk about history and we can talk about the wealth. I mean, I think that question of, of what would be a just outcome yeah. is a really provocative one to ask. And um, as I was listening to Maureen talk, I expected um, in the environment and setting in which I was teaching, primarily with students interested in social justice, um, I had assumed that there would be more of a universal view that um, people should retain some property interest. Um, and uh, that was not the case in the class, mm -hmm. um, which was very interesting to me. Um, so I think one important lesson that I continue to learn uh, as I teach inside the prison system is that, and Anna's here and she teaches inside out right now as well, um, that there is not a uniform point of view <laughs> about prisons, their role, um, you know, uh, how, whether people should be compensated, what kind of compensation they should have, and in fact, sometimes the voices from the inside students are more conservative than those of the outside students. Um, and so those were interesting points of debate. Um, and then um, we talked a lot also about this idea of how we might start to address this problem. Um, and clearly compensating the family individually at this point is not a, a way of addressing <laughs> even the tip of the iceberg. and when you consider the intergenerational trauma and embedded uh, issues. Um, but um, I had students reflect in a paper on what they did think might be an appropriate <laughs> response um, and brought in during that class the picture of Henrietta that's hanging now at the National Portrait Gallery. Um, and there's a photo that, that of her family with the portrait and kind of talking about um, how the this sort of journey has impacted them and, and where lar larger questions might go. Um, another thing I, I asked students to do because I was an English major undergraduate um, is I have them write, uh, approach an event from the perspective of an individual character mm -hmm. and reflect on concepts of intersectionality as they did that. Uh, and I expected a lot of people to pick Henrietta herself um, or her family members. Uh, m more students than I expected chose one of the scientists. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a mm -hmm. female research scientist who's doing uh, some experiments mm -hmm. and kind of give them a little bit of a voice <coughs> and think about how they also may have been constrained by their time. Um, yes. So uh, it's very easy to see things in a kind of black and white mm -hmm. <laughs> perspective today, um, but that they were also making decisions that may not have ended up being ethical decisions um, and also clearly mistreating mm -hmm. uh, Henrietta, but they also may have come from particular backgrounds and thinking about how to address those backgrounds better. Mm -hmm. So um, that was an interesting uh, set of essays that I got too. I just, I just, just to follow up, 
what you were saying about your students, um, uh, when they were thinking through what might be um, some compensation for the family, they, that was the response of students both in and out? Or yeah. That, that it wouldn't be adequate, a monetary compensation wouldn't be adequate? Yes, yeah, because I mean, for to, to spoil it for those of you who haven't read the book, I mean, there's a lot of, um, you know, there's deeply entrenched poverty, but there's also clearly um, one of the challenges that uh, Rebecca Sklut encounters is a strong distrust of research and science and embedded lack of education, and, and that they th there is really a basic, they have never been informed about right. what these cells are and what their power is and what they're doing, and there's never been that conversation mm -hmm. uh, for multiple reasons, and so thinking about um, ed starting educational programs yes. or how to make education more accessible um, were comments that people made. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if um, all of you have used the book in its entirety, or if there have been times when you used excerpts of, excerpts of it, or does it need to be read, read in its entirety because it has that narrative element to it? I've only used it in its entirety. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think it would be hard to excerpt because so many, so much of the story is the story of the relationship between the researcher and the mm -hmm. family um, that you might be able to. The, pick out it's a small part yeah. but I, I um I have used the book in its entirety as well. Um, um but I would say that in the, um there's also another approach in in that from my perspective you could so like the episode that I was talking about the the uh, the mass production um there actually is a really good I'm gonna say this quietly <laughs> <laughs> there's a really good BBC document documentary, which gives a great overview, um, which can be used to highlight certain episodes. So I would, I would suggest that resource if you wanted to use perhaps some episodes, because the clips, even though the whole film is available, um, the clips help to emphasize the particular episode. So the episode I was talking about, the cell, when uh, Tuskegee becomes a cell factory, Tuskegee University becomes a cell factory, um, there are other episodes that I, that I feel like I could use, I, although I have not. Yeah. I, have not used, I have not used it in that way. Yeah. Um, but even some of the news, um, newsy items that have come out later um, lend themselves to episodic mm -hmm. review. So for example, right. Maureen was talking about the fact that the family's DNA code was published online, right? Um, we can talk about how, what was the NIH response to that? Um, as, or at least, you know, certainly in my course, we could, we could use it in that way. Um, what, what was the NIH re response? The NIH um, came in and said, we will offer the family an advisory board. Because the family, frankly, does not have the scientific background in order to understand. They know they need protection. No, everyone always knows when they need justice. They just may not necessarily know exactly what that looks like. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And just as a practical point, I, I think for, in my course, we devoted four and a half to five weeks. just kind of add that um, I haven't taught the book itself, but I have taught from the history. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if somebody feels like there are important ethical issues <laughs> or events that you want to talk about that are dealt with in the book, you could just present them, you know, use, like you said, Terry, using other uh, materials, you know, film materials or uh, news articles or what, whatever and present it to the students as just that piece, just that one issue. I found that was very successful because it, it brings the general, th like all, a lot of our teaching, you, know, you have this general idea, but you want specific examples to say this is how it happened here. And I just should add that it, part of what's important is I'm teaching also in African American studies, right? So it's important to sort of disrupt some of the narratives that students have about what it means to be a person of color uh, in 2019. 
students are often thinking, um, and this just is, isn't just for African Americans, but students are often thinking from a very historical narrative. And um, so the, um, the conversation becomes very essentialist. And because the conversation becomes very essentialist, it has to be disrupted. Because uh, I can think, for example, um, the first time that I ever taught about Tuskegee, a student asked, well, how long ago was that? <laughs> and <laughs> during your parents' lifetime. I mean, you know, you know this is, this is a kind, you know, so she's thinking, you know, this is 19th century, and we're talking about, no, well, I've been alive. <laughs> so, um, so that's actually part of the responsibility that I feel in approaching the material for this text as well as for some of the other, other um, texts uh, uh, text and episodes that we need to talk about in this realm that are included in this realm. And I was, <coughs> oh. no, go ahead. I was, both Francine and Terry's comments are, um, making me think that when, for, I think the whole book has worked well in my courses because it's up to the point when they're reading that students have done a lot of theory and <coughs> a lot of theory that we've all inherited that separates mind and body um, and, uh, and considers objectivity to, to, to be not about the particulars of lived experience. And what has happened um, in, in every class where I've taught it, it's the details about um, both Henrietta's life as well as the, life, mm -hmm. the lives of her, her children and her family that becomes so um, compelling for students, right? It's um, so, you know, the toenail polish mm -hmm. that's on, right, that, that, um, which prompts the um, coroner to think about ha her painting her toenail, right? Like the, also the lack of health insurance, right? That, um, that while all of these, um, while her cells are producing all of these incredible fruitful results, you know, her family is living in poverty with no health insurance. Today. Uh, right. Yeah, still <laughs> today. today. Um, and how that is both institutional, structural, and historical, mm -hmm. but also actual, <laughs> right, Impressive. and lived. And that's for, particularly for my philosophy students, that's a really good thing for them to connect, mm -hmm. right, to start to really think about the way in which practices and decisions and ethical calculus and ethical calculus um, impacts the real lives of, of people. And so um, I think I could do sections and do a good job of it, but um, the kind of literary quality of it and the way in which it becomes very vivid, I think, for the reader, um, that becomes gripping. It's a really gripping story um, where, pe where people are imagining the body. Mm -hmm. I think that's, you know, you can't use that, I understand. <laughs> <laughs> I probably shouldn't have said that on tape. <laughs> But how bodies and minds yeah. are not different, are not dualistic, and and how they play out in the lives of the history. Yeah. I was just gonna add to, unless you wanna no, intervene, no. Um, that um, you were talking about those difficult conversations around race, mm -hmm. um, and that's clearly very true in the prison setting as well, since we have yeah, primarily right. African American inside students, mm -hmm. and very mm -hmm. few, um, always usually some, but few fewer African American or diverse outside students, um, and that can be particularly stark. Mm -hmm. um, but one of the the things that I have also found really difficult to address in, in a male prison is gender, mm -hmm. um, and in particular, mm -hmm. um, the men are are very much trained to put women on a pedestal, treat us very politely, <laughs> um, handle us with kid gloves mm -hmm. in the class, right? Hold the doors. Uh, and one of the things that is a constant theme here is how nice Henrietta is, right? Mm -hmm. She's so warm and wonderful to yeah. her family. She's so giving. Um, and it, this kind of allows you to interrogate when you're asking them to reflect on this. Um, who, you know, who is saying this? Um, you know, was she really happy to be mm -hmm. <laughs> cooking for her family after her cancer treatments? Mm -hmm. um, and then to also talk about health care, so not just the lack of health exactly. insurance, but um, sh she's a victim, uh, a survivor of a abuse, family abuse. She's, you know, married to a relative um, who she married, I think, at 14, mm -hmm. something like that, mm -hmm. um, who repeatedly has affairs. She has multiple episodes of syphilis. Mm -hmm. um, she has a, a woman's problem, mm -hmm. um, which, you know, she has put off seeking health care for. Um, and we, you can kind of talk about those gender roles too, um, which I think is, is another difficult thing to say, okay, hey, guys, <laughs> right, let's, let's dissect how nice you are to me and why it's a problem, you know, mm -hmm. so it's, it's so that, and that sort of a segue um, 
What I was going to ask was if you had encountered any particular challenges in using the book in your class. Sort of, you know, I'm wondering how do those conversations go? Like, for instance, those conversations about gender. I mean, is, is it is it um, is it fairly um, smooth and progressive? Because <laughs> I can imagine, and I haven't taught with the book, um, so I don't know from experience yet. But I can imagine that there would be challenges with this subject material on a number of levels, actually. But um, but I was just wondering if you had encountered any particular challenges in your in either students' reactions, I guess in particular in students' reactions. I think one of the challenges I've had is that <clears throat> some students will read this, will discuss it, and they'll say, that was bad, that was bad science, or that was a bad practice. Um, <clears throat> instead of, no, this is science, <laughs> and this is medicine, and this is uh, health care, and this is racism. Um, science is human, and it's, and it's racist as well as you know, progressive. And right. right. Yeah. And uh, so that's been one challenge, is to sort of chalk it up to um, a problematic incident, mm -hmm. um, and so it's. I feel like my job has been, and some of the other students in the class, is to keep recontextualizing this and connecting it to history, mm -hmm. connecting it, you know, um, and saying we're actually doing further harm to say this is just a bad episode um, because it's actually quite connected to a history of um, a mis why there is incredible mistrust and rightfully so within. Um, many people within the black community of, um, of medicine or scientific research. Um, so that, that's one challenge is kind of, especially the science majors who, and who pre-med students who are like, and I'll be a good doctor and this will, you know, this is a bad <laughs> thing I learned from, right? And um, it, so kind of how can implicit bias, how can your own work in this, um, that's been one. Yeah, yeah, no, I would agree with that. Um, they're just to add their, so hopeful and so excited, <laughs> <laughs> and you're, just, you're striking the balance between, you know, the, this is reality too. Um, actually, I haven't had a lot of pushback. Um, if anything, it's um, sort of wanting to. So let me just say, in the uh, because I'm teaching in a particular course, medical ethics, I actually don't see a lot of African American students in, in this class. So. Um, uh, so sometimes this is as close of a race conversation that some of the students have actually had. There, um, and, and, and in Health and Human Services, this is not unusual among the faculty, but it's a very cross-disciplinary course, again. It's a, um, we're seeing students from engineering, we're seeing students who, you know, hope to have um, careers in medicine and, and, uh, and healthcare more broadly. Um, so, because they're taught to think that science is neutral, um, once again, it's the idea of, oh, I can think about this too. And to get them to think about the social level, not just the individual level. What are, what are the impacts? Does it matter whether African Americans mistrust medicine or not, right? Uh, well, does it matter if African Americans mistrust medicine and there's a need for clinical trials of a new drug? Yeah, all right. So, so actually the pushback is more that they feel challenged to think broadly enough. That, oh, I didn't realize, you know, so I talked about the student who was sort of in denial. Um, that was in a different context. But generally speaking, uh, the students I've experienced here are very open to thinking about the conversation. Yes, it's challenging in the sense that, oh, I've never had to think about that, is really more what they say. Or why haven't I had to think about this before? The three of you have expressed a really rich, um, multidisciplinary background in your own training that I think offers you an incredible set of tools in your own toolbox for how to navigate um, uncertainty and ambiguity around teaching something like this. Um, and so I'm wondering if it's possible for you, because um, I don't know how you step outside of that experience, because it's yours, um, for, if we're doing this as kind of a campus reads experience, for faculty who all of their training is in one discipline or don't have 
aren't, aren't sitting in a place as a business major turned health and human services turned African American scholar turned <laughs> writer, lawyer, person, <laughs> whatever Maureen is, for goodness sake. Um, so if, if you're not able to draw, I mean, how, what kind of tips or what kind of thoughts might you share around that healthy tolerance for ambiguity and the ability, or, or what would you suggest to, to sort of increase the tools um, for faculty on this campus who are seeking to do this? I know, that, I know that we're collecting resources, we are, right? Yeah. So that, I think that will be a helpful, helpful tool. And I know I'm just from my multi, multidisciplinary life, I'm thinking every time I think of something, I kind of send it to Margaret. <laughs> so I'm hopeful. I don't know what else. I think be. you can pick a lens. I think that most reading group questions, you know, that I looked up online, right, were probably the Oprah Book mm. Club version, mm -hmm. um, which tends to come from its own particular <laughs> discipline. Um, uh, but I, I think maybe a good idea, and that's a great question, towards yeah. creating a resource could be creating reading group guides that are disciplinary because I think you can enter this book from different perspectives mm -hmm. and so you know one of the things that I love about this too is that um, while the story itself is is not necessarily a hopeful story um, you've got the great story of this this student who is this as a student initiates this whole thing um, and so there's a lot of power there um, from someone who started from a position of knowing nothing, went to her community college professor, I think, and said, hey. Um, but I, I, I think you could look at this in a disciplinary way and Absolutely. at least oh, carve yeah. it out and say, okay, these are points of access yeah. for you and for your students. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, one suggestion would be to, if you want to connect this to the larger community, I was thinking you could put it on recommended reading for your class and then revisit it like Terry suggested with a small part of a documentary or a particular you know, incident and then the students have it if they want to access it. Um, but, you know. Yeah, I, I, it just, your question Patricia, made me think, I, so I had a conversation with a friend who does, doesn't teach here but is a biologist um, about the book after the first time I had read it. Um, <clears throat> and so she had heard of HeLa cells but hadn't known the story. Um, and so she read it and then I asked her to let me know what she thought about it. And, um, and so we talked after that and she is teaching it. Um, she's a biologist. So <clears throat> she actually was able to answer some questions for me too about, I'm like, what is the hey flick limit or something? Like, uh, like to really try to understand a bit more about, you know, why these cells reproduce the way that they did. But, um, <clears throat> but she, she wondered that, right? She, um, when I was describing it to her, she thought, I, I don't know if I could really teach this in a course, given how much content I have and other sorts of things. Um, and the way she has it is it's, an, it's one assignment that you can choose. Um, and <clears throat> um, But what she had said was, I think, similar to, that, so she sort of picked the biological lens and has used her surprise as part of what she teaches, which is, uh, there's a lot of stuff in here I didn't know because I knew a lot about HeLa cells before. I knew that they were involved in a lot of different um, studies and that they had been uh, really effective, but I never knew that history. And so, um, so and she, I, I've she done that. She never knew so much about something she knew so much about. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, and I think I've done that to an extent too, and parts of it that, I, that, I, that were not within my area of expertise, um, that I shared that with students. Uh, like here's what I've learned about, uh, about the hay flick limit. <laughs> That's <even great>. um, <clears throat> but also why it is that um, that science has, in, ge in general, hasn't done a great job of communicating um, yes. information to interested and invested in relevant communities. Um, so. That, that's one thought is maybe picking a lens and also the parts that are new, incorporating that into the teaching and asking students how they might respond to it from their disciplinary points of view. <coughs> but you could just do this like as a legal book in mm -hmm. some ways, I yeah. can imagine, or just mm -hmm. as a book on, in ethics. Yeah. I'm wondering from a, from a writing study, from a writer's point of view, if the, because this is a, um, a story of research, a Sloot, Rebecca Sloot's research too. 
And if the, um, the reality of a white researcher yes. who's done so, really started out in a humble way, but then, you know, this is, I mean, this is her business now, more right. than a cottage business. Exactly. That is one of the right. pushbacks I've gotten from okay. students. So yeah. then, and it's something that Terry and I have talked a little bit about, and, and Amy and I have talked about, but um, how we're going to address, you know, how we might address that, that layer of things in co-curricular programming for faculty and for students, because you all mentioned the readability of the book, how gripping it is. And in some ways, that very readability, that, 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 uh, that expertise and narrative that Skloot employs is in itself, you could say, it's, it, it, it could be seen as exploiting, again, the lives of these folks who have gotten so little out of such a sacrifice that their, their mother made. So, I, yeah, I was just wondering if that had come up in any of, the, in any of your discussions or student reactions? Actually, it hasn't come up. It, and um, I actually teach it alongside, or in addition to the book critique assignment, I have, uh, by that time, they will have already, we have already talked about things like Tuskegee and thus how the science of developing Tuskegee or the lack of science in developing Tuskegee. So um, the question is no, that we, I have not talked about that aspect of it. Um, I try to leave them with something. I mean, yeah. <laughs> like, you know, try to leave a little hope. <laughs> so no, I, ha I haven't. But I think if we were doing it for the community read, that'd be something that I would prefer right. that we put on the table. On the table. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Well, this, this is something. Oh, yeah, oh, just let me just. Uh, oh, right. Right. Because it actually came up during um, one of the professional organizations, the American Society for Bioethics and the Humanities had Sklut at one of the meetings right after uh, right after the book was published and became very popular and there was definite blowback. Right. So um, yeah, that whole, her, her, indu her industry having become her life now. Right, and um, you and I talked a little bit exactly. about Carla Holloway's work yes. and, and her book, Private, which I haven't read, but Private Bodies, Public Text, mm -hmm. and, and she, she takes on Sklut and this, Levels of I was just going to say this is a conversation that me is happening across disciplines yeah. and would be great to have a bigger conversation yes. about because I certainly agree. in sociology, history, anthropology, we're all revisiting sure. uh, works that were formerly mm -hmm. <laughs> praised and asking some very similar questions. And I had students who wanted to know how you know, how well did the book do? And um, and we looked at, Sklut has a foundation that she set up yeah. for the family. Um, but I actually, I had a, a pre-med student, a black male student's pre-med who um, came to me during office hours and we were talking and he was saying, he, you know, he was concerned about Sklut's role in this and was it, uh, but then he also said to me, and why are you teaching this um, yeah. as a, <coughs> a white professor, a white woman? Um, and so we had a conversation about that, um, which I think ended up in, in, on the note of like this is this is a human rights issue, this is an issue of justice, um, and um, and <coughs> and I recognize though that when we're talking about the experiences that students are reading about, that this is resonating in different ways for different students, mm -hmm. um, and but I appreciated the question. Um, because that, that's another issue, too, is um, who's teaching it, how are they teaching it, how are they relating to the experiences that are going on. Um, and who's benefiting, and right, who's right. benefiting in ways that none of us right. Right. benefit from engaging with the text. And so one of the things that we've been talking about on the committee is if we were to invite her to campus and she would come to campus, mm -hmm. um, which are two big ifs, but you know, how would we frame that for a campus community when you know she, you know, is still selling books. And, and there's nothing, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with selling books, but she's selling books. And um, so that the, the ethics of, of publication and, and research on one level, but then this research and publication on, on um, and how those texts are circulating. I think it was, the Washington, was it Washington University? I can check and make sure, did a community read using this book? But they invited um, members of the family rather than exclude. 
<clears throat> just oh, just let me just add one piece here. So, in addition to so, uh, part of the com part of that larger conversation could be in addition to what Patricia asked about approaches from disciplinary ways. Um, there is a need, actually, from my perspective, to talk about so part of that conversation to be the pedagogy of embodiment, right? Mm -hmm. So your student asked, why are you teaching it? And I know, I know, although they don't necessarily challenge me on it. Um, I know there are students who are thinking, why is this black woman teaching us about black women, right? I, I, because that's just how students think. And so it's, it, it, fortunately, as a part of my training, I had people who had already talked to me about pedagogy of embodiment so that, um, so that I can understand that, that this is important and valuable text, period. And that if students want to talk about that, I can talk about the embodiment that I bring to the to the table. Um, but look, but then I can also say, well, we can look around the room too and see who's in this medical ethics class and ask, is it important? <coughs> is it important that as we grow our future healthcare professionals, that you have healthcare professionals who look like the um, who look like the society that you're treating? I just wanted to um, just my background is primarily anthropology, some sociology, and lots of other things. Uh, this is a, I think this is a wider issue. And I think focusing on sclut, um, which some people do and say, well, what about her? You know, take her money because she can't benefit from this, is again ignoring or denying that larger societal and historical context that uh, I know anthropologists have been dealing with this sort of, you know, flagellating themselves since at least the 1960s. Um, that, you know, and basically work with the concept of emic and etic perspectives, you know, which you all know, in research, that you have the perspective of an outside observer. And then basically what's happened since then is people say, yes, I am an outside observer. This is who I am, and this is how I'm coming to this. And then the, um, the emic, obviously the words coming from phonetic and phonemic approach would be an insider's perspective. But again, it's important to say, yes, I'm an insider. You know, just like on the radio or television, they say, you know, we've got to tell you that these people support our program. And maybe that's, you think we're not fair because of that. So that's, there is a lot of material on this in the social <coughs> sciences especially. Um, probably in other sciences or research areas as well, and, but that's part of our whole, as you say, enlightenment, you know, the whole model that we work on is that we study things and then we write about them. Mm -hmm. And so maybe that's something that we can challenge on a wider level is the idea of a world without studying and research and writing, you know, because most of our history was, has been without studying, or at least without writing. But, but in other words, I think we just should personalize it, just exclude it, just you know, just this issue. Yeah, I mean, I I, I don't think I disagree with a lot of what you said, Karen. I think though it's hard not to personalize, you know, a text like this. I mean, it's very very personal, and and it it seems to me that you know what really strikes me about the it's just the materiality of the book is you know the cover and the illustration. And then on the back cover is there's this glamour shot of you know Sclut. I mean it's just it's you know it, if you're from a writing studies per, a rhetorical perspective, that's the stuff you want to deal with. Yeah. Questions? This gave us a lot of food for thought. So are you the one that we should send resources to? Um, yeah, I mean, I can collect those resources or Holly. Amy, did you want to say something? Well, well this, I would add is that that's our fall program. Um, we are looking at creating a panel discussion, uh, which would be led by Luke Schaefer from um, Ann Arbor. So for those who might not be familiar with Luke Schaefer, uh, he leads the Poverty Solutions Center in Ann Arbor and has an interesting perspective to bring um, he wrote a book um, as part of his research, Two Dollars a Day, Living in Poverty in America, which became an immediate New York Times bestseller, and has faced some of the same, I think, conundrums that we've talked about here in that he didn't uh, 
uh, necessarily foresee that this was going to be a New York Times bestseller, right? And, 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 and certainly shared some thoughts with both Margaret and I and is excited to come and join us um, and lead a panel to discuss some difficult issues without uh, school here, right? So that will be a conversation on our campus with our own faculty and the group. So that's something we're looking at for October, so I think that will add a nice, um, a nice program um, to some of the other things we're thinking about. Um, I believe there's already a resources page. Mm -hmm. So we do already have a resources page, so any information that's coming in, whether it's to Margaret or myself or Tyler, we can certainly make sure we're getting all of those resources updated so that um, faculty have all of those resources to, to look through and see what makes the most sense. Yeah, so and any ideas about programming for next year that would help support the teaching? If you're going to teach it, I don't know if you all are teaching with this book next but if anybody's considering teaching with it, the kind of resources that might be supportive of that teaching in the fall, if you have ideas that might, um, you know, ab absolutely pass those along as well. And the web URL is uh, umdmr.edu forward slash community reading. It's very easy to remember just the name of the, the program. Uh, the landing page is more student-centric. It'll have events and things. Uh, but then there's a tab, faculty resources, that will have all of the the information and resources compiled for faculty to access. Mm -hmm. um, and additionally, the publisher is willing to send uh, digital copies of the book to any faculty interested in using the, the text as well. So, oh, is that right? Yeah. Oh, great. Yes. That's, um, that's they just me. left me a voicemail yesterday, actually. Oh, yeah. great. Well, we want to make an announcement about that. Yeah. That's great. And we do have, as I said earlier, we do have hard copies available that Holly can, can um, distribute. Yeah. Um, so if you're if your colleagues are interested in, in, in looking at the book this summer with an eye to perhaps teaching in the fall, then um, we can, Holly would be the person. Yeah, I to. think probably the easiest thing would just be to um, send me an email and we'll make sure, I know you guys all have books, but we can, we'll put it, send out another announcement. You can send me an email and we'll put that out there and then I can have it ready for you at the desk at the library or if you need to, we can deliver them. So. Holly, I meant to yeah. check and I didn't, but yeah. so um, do, do you know the ebook status and the licensing? Yes. Right. Oh, sorry to do a little inside. No, part, it's, we can't get, we can only buy a single use copy. Um, and it's right now the is e an ebook. So that would mean that only one person could read it at a time, right. which doesn't really help us that much. <laughs> we had, um, you know, at, we have had and have books, ebooks that anyone, you know, are, you know, any uh, unlimited checkout, which means anyone can read them at any time, and you can check it out for, you know, a given amount of time, and but 50 um, people can be reading use. it. But yeah. this one is only single, and that's what um, mm -hmm. Tyler also found out from our right. publisher, and we found out from our our avenues. Tyler was so. OER head on. <laughs> yeah, it's it's unfortunate because yeah. it's it's very helpful if we right. can have that because then the students really do um, have no problem getting access to it. So thanks. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, everybody.